How's it going everyone? Today I'm continuing on with the large format series and going over the kit that I put together for shooting my 4x5 as well as a couple of the adjustments I've made since my first shoot with the camera. So if that sounds good to you, stick around. First off, just a disclaimer, this isn't uh, meant to be a definitive guide or anything. These are just the things that I picked up from my own kit to start out with. I suppose this will be more of a what's in my bag kind of video, but I'm gonna cover a couple things that aren't actually in the bag, but really play an important part. Um, there's probably even better options out there for some of these things. Uh, and if you have some suggestions, I welcome those in the comments below. So with that out of the way, let's get into it. Number one appropriately is the camera itself. I own a Toyo 45G 4x5 monorail camera, the original Mark I version, not the Mark II. Uh, I did a whole video going over this camera when I bought it, so I'll keep it brief here and just link to that video up in the corner up here. Uh, this is considered a system camera because everything is modular and it's made to work within the Toyo ecosystem of accessories. That means everything comes apart really well and it's interchangeable, uh, but that also means it's heavy and bulky uh, since it's more intended for studio use and not really for carrying around on your back. Uh, that poses some challenges, which I'll get into more detail about here in a second. On the front of the camera is my 180 millimeter Fuji Fujinon W f5.6 lens. Uh, at 180 millimeters, this should be roughly equivalent to a 45 millimeter lens for your full frame DSLR or mirrorless. So it's pretty normal focal length. Uh, currently, this is the only lens that I own uh, for this camera, but I do intend to expand on my collection in the near future. With this one being in the middle of the road, um, I'd like to go out to the other ends of the spectrum. So a bit wider and a bit longer. This lens is actually mounted on a Linhof style board, which doesn't fit natively onto the Toyo front standard, since uh, the Toyo boards actually look more like this. Uh, the Linhof style seems much more common though, and it's a lot smaller. So that means as I acquire more lenses and mount them on these boards, uh, the entire assembly can just go in the bag and it takes up a lot less space. Uh, and they're really super simple to change out since they're all ready to go on the boards, just like that. So to allow me to use the Linhof style lens boards on my camera, um, I had to purchase this Toyo front adapter plate for the front standard, which steps it down to the Linhof size. Now compacting this camera down enough to get it to fit into a backpack was a real challenge. Uh, the official case for this camera is actually a plywood chest, which is obviously no good for hiking around with. Um, and it's not really practical to carry this around fully assembled like this either, but all the support for this camera comes from the monorail right here. So taking the standards off of the rail means they flop around and kind of clack together in the bag, which increases the likelihood of doing damage to the camera. Uh, and the camera is modular and comes completely apart, but I didn't feel like doing that really protected the delicate parts of the camera very well, such as the bellows and the ground glass on the back. Besides completely disassembling and reassembling this camera every time I want to use it is a real pain. Plus since they're really bulky parts, the front standards and stuff, it doesn't really save a whole lot of space in the bag to take it apart like that. So basically I needed a way to hold the two standards together and compress the whole camera down uh, without the main monorail installed. So I designed and 3D printed a pin of the correct diameter to lock the standards down on, but still short enough uh, that the whole thing when put together um, and assembled still fits inside of a backpack. Uh, I also designed a couple of these dog bones to link the uprights of the front and rear standards together thinking that this would provide additional support. Um, but as it turns out, the plastic pin was actually enough to hold the camera solid without them. The end result was I was really pleased with and it makes the camera a lot more portable. So the bag I'm putting this whole kit into is the F64 BPX backpack. This is the extra large size, came from Amazon. The bag has two compartments, uh, the lower one being big enough to fit the entire compressed camera in one piece, along with the rails on the side and the rest of the camera parts and the tripod adapter. Uh, and that leaves me the top compartment for lenses, uh, light meter, other accessories, things like that. The bag also comes with two of F64's uh, film holder cases that strap to the side of the bag and they comfortably fit, you know, five or six holders in each one. I also like the idea of keeping the film holders in their own little zip up compartment like this because as you're fiddling around in the main side of the bag, uh, the main compartments, it keeps those film holders in complete darkness until the very last second when you're ready to use them, just in case. Overall, the backpack is huge. This is probably the largest camera bag I've ever seen. Um, the straps are decent, got pretty okay padding on them. The hip belt is pretty wide, so hopefully that's really comfortable. Uh, but that's about all the opinions I really have on it because 
I haven't actually worn this around much, especially with a lot of weight in it. Uh, so a TBD on that, I guess. Next up is the dark cloth. That's so iconic to large format photography. The lens I have has a maximum aperture of f5.6, which creates a really nice bright projection on the ground glass, but uh, compared to a modern LCD, it's still pretty hard to see. That's where the dark cloth comes in. Mine is the Harrison Silver Classic, size small from B&H Photo. Uh, it has the waterproof silver finish on the outside, black fabric on the inside, uh, and it has the Velcro on the front to help you tie it around tightly around the back of the camera and keep light out. That just makes it nice and dark so you can really see the image on the ground glass as you compose your photo. Since you also can't digitally zoom way in like you can on a digital camera, um, I use this 4X loop to magnify the image on the ground glass uh, to see how sharp my subject is. Uh, this is just something that I've had laying around for a long time. It just happens to be a nice compact size, which makes it perfect for the field kit. You can find similar ones all over with even higher magnification factors, but I find the 4X does just fine for what I'm doing with it. So next up, I need something to set this behemoth of a camera on. So let's talk about my tripod. It was immediately apparent to me after my first shoot with the 4x5 that uh, I needed a larger set of legs than what I was using. This camera is just really heavy, so it was pushing the weight capacity of that other tripod. So I sprung for an upgrade. This is the Leo Photo Mountain Series LN404C. And honestly, it's entirely overkill for this camera. It's seven and a half pounds all by itself. It has four section telescoping carbon fiber legs with single twist locking mechanisms. It accepts a 100 millimeter bowl style platform, holds a ridiculous maximum payload of 110 pounds. It's 27 inches all folded up and the platform is an absolutely mental 74 inches off the ground fully extended. I'm 71 inches tall and I can literally stand underneath this thing. Leo Photo is a Chinese company, and from the looks of it, they appear to be trying to punch in the Gitzo weight class with a lot of their products, uh, but with quite a bit lower price tags. Even still, this wasn't particularly cheap. Uh, it retails right at $650 US on Amazon, but I did get a much better deal getting it straight from China on eBay. Just be advised that you're accepting a bit of risk if you do that like I did, uh, because if you don't like it and you want to return it, the shipping on something this big and heavy might actually cost you half that price all over again. So if you're not comfortable with that, uh, might be better to look for a US seller. That being said, uh, I have no intention of sending this back because so far it, the build on it seems really solid. So sitting on top of that platform is my Manfrotto 808 RC three-way tripod head. Uh, it's pretty simple. It's just a pan and tilt style instead of a ball head because it provides a lot better control with such a heavy camera. Uh, just doing one axis at a time. It does have a quick release plate, uh, which is far bigger than your normal Arca Swiss style. And it mates up with my mono rail tripod adapter really well. Um, it also includes a safety lock that clips into the head to help keep the camera from flopping off the tripod in case you don't tighten it down enough. Pretty handy feature to have when you're trying to mount such an awkward and delicate camera with both hands. Add all these together and I have a super solid feeling mount now for the camera, uh, which I'm pretty happy with at the moment. So, okay. so. Camera setup, uh, images composed, and we're focused. Uh, what's next? That would be the light meter. Mine is a Pentax digital spot meter, which I also picked up off eBay. Uh, I went this route instead of one of the Seikonic meters just because I felt like the Seikonic stuff was a little overcomplicated. Uh, I really like the idea of just the one button approach to the Pentax. It has a trigger and just shows you an exposure value. From there, it's up to you to interpret the result into camera settings. Mine has a zone system sticker that I applied uh, to help me do that. These meters do take a small battery though, so I have a spare in my kit just in case it dies unexpectedly because you definitely don't want to be caught without a light meter. The other thing I wanted to mention was on the front. Uh, this meter actually has a 40.5 millimeter filter thread on the front barrel. Uh, that means you can thread on a small UV filter or a lens cap. I was actually able to find both on Amazon. Uh, which is pretty nice considering these meters are certainly not cheap uh, and that little addition just helps protect the meter. Speaking of filters, here's my filter kit. This is the Lee 100 millimeter filter system that I use on all my cameras, film and digital. I just have an assortment of these adapters for the filter holder. This one's a 62 millimeter ring that works with my 180 millimeter lens on the 4x5 and lets me use my assortment of grad filters, uh, NDs, landscape polarizer. The whole thing is just housed in this low pro filter holder. Uh, this is the filter pouch 100. It has a nice little Velcro strap that you can put around a belt loop or hang to your pack. Uh, but I just 
tend to like a little more protection on it, so I'll just put the whole thing inside my bag. So that's everything to set up a composition. Uh, now let's talk about the film side of things for a second. My camera came with a bunch of additional items, including five of these Fidelity Elite film holders. Uh, I understand that the Toyo holders have a better reputation, but these were pretty handy for getting me up and going, and so far so good, I haven't had any problems with these yet. Um, I actually just ordered five more of these holders uh, for 50 bucks on eBay. That'll give me more capacity uh, to carry more film, of course, uh, but that also means that I can carry a variety of films as well. I can load some film holders of black and white, some with color negative, for example, and then just choose the film on the fly to fit the scene I'm trying to shoot. When it comes to loading film, I needed something portable since I plan to take this camera with me, you know, really far away from home. At first, I went with a film changing bag, the Patterson 27 by 27 inch that you can get for about 30 bucks on B&H. Unfortunately, I found it hard to work with for my skill level. The armholes are a bit tight for me and uh, I had a difficult time with getting the film in the holders while the top of the bag just kept collapsing down on where you're trying to work. I tried placing different objects in the bag to help prop it up, uh, kind of like a tent, but with several film holders and a box of film in there, there isn't much room to do that. Uh, so eventually I just caved and bought the Harrison Pup tent. The arm cuffs are much more appropriately sized for my forearms, which I don't really think I have that big of forearms, but whatever. Even though this is the smaller version, I find it to be just about right for my stack of 4x5 film holders and a box of film. It's definitely not big enough if you were shooting 8x10, you'd want to go with the bigger one for that for sure, but for the 4x5 it seems to strike a really good balance between room to work and small enough footprint to take on the road and load film in the back of my 4Runner. I suppose the bag is just a good backup option, uh, just in case something happens to the tent while I'm on a trip somewhere. So just a couple of miscellaneous items left. Uh, the first one is a cable release. This is a pretty critical piece of kit for a camera like this since large format lenses are really designed to be used with a cable. I suppose you probably could trigger them without one, uh, but it'd be really hard to do so accurately uh, and definitely hard to do so without shaking the camera. I took a tip from Ben Horn and I have an extra in my kit just in case something happens to my primary. Fortunately, they're pretty cheap. I think I got two of them from B&H for like 15 bucks. Along those lines is this really cheap stopwatch I picked up from Amazon. Uh, this one is digital, so there's a risk it could run out of batteries in the field, but I'm pretty sure I could probably get by with my iPhone if that really happened. I found countdown mode really handy so far. Uh, with everything you have to pay attention to, I found myself actually forgetting in the moment while the watch was timing uh, just how many seconds my calculated exposure was, which is super weird. But in countdown mode, uh, I don't have to worry about that. I just program in the shutter speed into the stopwatch, and I just have to focus on closing the shutter when it reaches zero. Getting close to the end now, just a few smaller items. This notepad I picked up from B&H, which is specifically laid out for large format photography with places to write in the film information, holder, uh, camera movements, bellows, extension, etc. As long as I remember to fill this out, it just gives me a way to record my settings for future reference. Uh, I can type this into metadata later or whatever I want to do with it. It even comes with a few helpful charts and zone system cheat sheets in the front, which can be helpful in the field if I need to reference something. And then there's a the gray card, uh, or more accurately, this really cheap white balance kit from Amazon, which includes a white, black, and then a 50% gray card. That just gives me a target I can meter off of just in case I run into a scene that's particularly difficult to get a reading on. And then the very last thing is this small tape measure that I can use to calculate my bellows extension factor in case I'm setting up on a scene that requires that, such as a subject that's on the ground or something really close to the camera. This is just a really nice keychain tape measure from Milwaukee that I had laying around uh, and it fits really nicely in the camera bag. So that's everything in my large format field kit. Like I mentioned in the beginning of this video, this wasn't really meant to be a definitive guide to large format photography equipment. Uh, it's just the things that I've assembled for my personal kit thus far. If you're new to large format like I am, hopefully this has been a nice overview of the kinds of things to consider. Uh, and if you're a veteran, I hope it was at least entertaining. If I missed anything completely uh, that you think I should look into, let me know down in the comments. I appreciate the feedback as always. So that's it for me this time. Uh, I just want to say thanks for watching. And if you're enjoying these videos, it would really help me out if you'd hit that like button. And if you'd like to follow along in my journey into learning large format photography, hit that subscribe button and ring the bell if you'd like to be notified when new videos come out. Above all, thanks for watching and I hope to catch you in the next video. Take care.